This is a book written by the guru of one of our lovely participants, Sky Guardian. Sky Guardian has graciously asked his guru to aid in sending his book to us so that we could read it in our Sangha. And he even got Swamiji to sign it for us with prayers and blessings so that this book has a spiritual charge to it. He also said that you don't have to buy it because he's making the PDF for this whole book free sometime in the near future, I suspect. This book takes us currently in an ashram, a spiritual hermitage on the Ganges, a spiritual river in Rishikesh, a spiritual town in India, a spiritual country. Here, before Swami was a Swami, his name was Mark. And Mark, well, I'll let him describe how his life is going. Mataji approached the bench where Swami Prakash and I had been sitting for over an hour. Excuse me, Swamiji, she said apologetically. Swami Sudananda would like to speak with you. Please tell him I am coming. Turning to me, he said, Well, my friend, we must continue later, isn't it? I remained on the bench, watching the morning sun sparkle on the dancing river. I didn't get the opportunity to tell Swami Prakash of my upcoming initiation to become a Swami myself. I mulled over our conversation, thinking about how life-shaping journeys begin when the desire for spiritual growth emerges. Strangely, I recalled a passage in J.R.R. Tolkien's Hobbit where Bilbo reluctantly leaves his comfortable hobbit hole to undertake a fantastic adventure. Gandalf, the wise wizard, says to Bilbo, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Profound stuff for a fictitious wizard, I thought. But then again, Gandalf had apparently uttered the same words written long before by the Chinese Taoist Lao Tzu in his well-known work, the Tao Te Ching. A Silent Sadhu After evening puja at the temple, Vijay, my friend, and I strolled back and forth through the small ashram compound, waiting for dinner. We walked slowly, talking in hushed voices as the sky grew dark. The garden's fragrant blossom scented the air. Vijay stopped when we neared the gate and said, I know one sadhu who is living in a cave in mountains near Nilkanth. He has taken a vow of silence. He is a Mauni. He is meditating in that cave for over ten years. Sometimes he is sitting outside to give blessings to people, but he is never speaking to anyone. That's amazing, I exclaimed. He hasn't left his cave or spoken for ten years? No, he is very strict. What does he do about food, I asked. Some devotees from Rishikesh are bringing him food. They go up to the cave every day. They are wanting to receive his blessings. Intrigued by the prospect of meeting such a great ascetic saint, I asked, could we go up to see him? Why not we go tomorrow, Vijay replied, obviously delighted by my interest. We had shared adventures like this many times before. 
He enjoyed them as much as I. He said that the cave is about eight miles away. If we left early tomorrow morning, we could reach the cave and return before nightfall. Before I could learn anything more about the silent sadhu, the cook stopped out from the kitchen and sounded a brass gong hanging from a tree limb, announcing dinner time. Inside the dining hall, we stood in line and joined the ashram residents, enchanting the familiar verses of the Bhagavad Gita, customarily recited before meals. As we passed by the cauldrons of steaming food, we were served rotis, flatbreads, spicy curries, and mounds of rice. I sat on the floor next to Vijay, trying not to drop food from my fingers onto my white dhoti. At six o'clock the following morning, Vijay arrived at my room with two cups of tea. We clicked quickly gulped the sweet concoction and immediately set out so we could complete most of our journey before the hillsides baked in the midday heat. As we passed through the narrow lanes just outside our ashram, the villagers living nearby were rising and preparing for a new day. A wiry man in a torn t-shirt was vigorously scrubbing his teeth with a twig from a neem tree a handy disposable toothbrush used in villages throughout the country. The neem tree is regarded highly by practitioners of folk medicine. Its bark, leaves, and twigs are said to have medicinal value. But, judging from the many villagers I've observed with just a few teeth remaining, it seemed doubtful that the neem twigs prevented gum disease. <laughs> Vijay and I approached the marketplace near the river, where shabby makeshift stalls crowded together on either side of the road. Yeah, on either side of the road remained closed except for one tiny tea stand. There, I saw a young man prepare a cup of tea by straining the brew through a sock. An inelegant but eminently practical filter. The waiting customer watched us with curiosity as we passed in the twilight. Vijay and I soon reached the Ram Jhula, a narrow footbridge spanning the Ganges suspended on a spidery network of steel cables. It swayed gently as we crossed. Not far below, the Ganges flowed almost silently. On the far back of the river, ashrams sprawled across the narrow strip of land between the river and mountains. As we skirted one of them, the morning stillness was broken by a melodious chanting. The ancient Sanskrit verses drifting over the ashram's walls implored, May all creatures be happy. And with that, we will pause our reading there before Vijay and Mark, soon to become Swami Tadatmanandaji, continue on their quest to find this ascetic sadhu who has taken a complete vow of silence, meditating in the caves for a decade now. I certainly look forward to their meeting of him tomorrow as we continue with our journey through Roar of the Ganges. <laughs>